This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective... Sherlock Holmes. Oh, and say, I'd like to tell you about something myself. I'd like to tell you about the wine that more Americans prefer than any other wine. That wine is port. And if you want to know why port is such a favorite, just pour yourself a glass of wonderful Petri California port. Look at that Petri port. Look at its glowing deep red color. And sample that aroma. It'll remind you of of a walk through a dew-covered vineyard. And now taste that Petri port. Boy, you've got something. Petri Port is one of the most delicious wines ever poured from a bottle. Right then and there, Petri Port will become your favorite wine. I'm confident of that. And I'm sure you'll want to serve Petri Port to your friends, too. After dinner or any time they drop in for a visit. And remember, you can serve Petri Port proudly. Because those letters, P-E-T-R-I, spell the proudest name in the history of American wines. Petri. Petri Wine. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's ready for us. Let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Good evening. Uh, oh, excuse me, Dr. Watson. I, I didn't know that you had company. Shut the door, my boy, and come in and join us. Let me introduce you, Mr. Bartell. This is my friend, Mrs. Campbell. How do you do, Mrs. Campbell? How do you do, Mr. Bartell? Mrs. Campbell is a very old friend of mine from England, and when she called on me today, I persuaded her to stay and have dinner... And then join us in this little session of, of storytelling. You see, Mr. Bartell, she's really what you might call the star of the Sherlock Holmes adventure that I'm going to tell you tonight. Oh, come now, Dr. Watson. I actually played a very small part of the story. In any case, I was much too young at the time to know what was really going on. Say, this is a great idea, Doctor. One of the characters out of your fabulous past here in California in 1946... And helps tell her own story. Oh, no, Mr. Bartell. I'm no storyteller. That's the doctor's department. I'll just listen. No, 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 my dear. I'll set the scene, but you must uh, ring up the curtain, as it were. In any case, my memory isn't too clear on some of the early points in connection with the case. You will have to help me out. Oh, but you're talking to millions of listeners on the radio. I'd be terrified to speak over the air. We're on the air now, Mrs. Campbell. Oh, oh, we're not, are we? Oh, oh, dear. (laughs) Oh, no, no, no. Don't worry, Cynthia. If they're kind enough to listen to me week after week, I'm sure they'll be delighted to hear you. And now to get on with the story. The title, The Adventure of the Living Doll. The setting, the Sussex Downs near the bee farm to which Sherlock Holmes retired. The period, 1910. And now, Cynthia, my dear, the curtain's going up, and the first scene belongs to you. Supposing you set it for us. Well, I'll try We were living on the Sussex Downs also, Mr. Bartell, at that time. My name was then Cynthia Browning. My father, Arthur Browning, had been dead for some years. But my mother kept up the estate with a manager, a Mr. Hugh Tanner. I was away at school most of the year, of course. But the happiest times of my childhood were spent during those long summer months in Sussex. I lived in a small world, knowing only a few people and loving all of them, or almost all. First of all, there was Mother herself. She was the most beautiful woman in the world, and the sweetest. I remember she gave me a puppy on my twelfth birthday. His name was Dusty, and he was so sweet. I talked to Mother about him one day. I I must have sounded terribly young. Mommy, darling, I do love Dusty very, very much. He's a lovely puppy, and you gave him to me. You love him, Cynthia. I know that. But I've been feeding him. That's your job, darling. It's good for grown-up people to have responsibility. Oh, Mommy, I'll feed him. Of course I will. I'll feed him so full, he'll burst. Then there was the estate manager, Hugh Tanner. Such a pleasant man, and so willing to tell a 12-year-old all the things that a 12-year-old has to know or die. But, Mr. Tanner, why did you have to shoot the horse? He'd only broken his leg. Cynthia, horses aren't like human beings. Their legs won't mend. Now, think of a horse that couldn't frisk and run and, and 
gallop across the downs. We're actually being kind to him. Honest we are, Cynthia. And then there was Frank King, the painter who lived on the downs. He taught me to open my eyes and really see things. No, 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 Cynthia. That sunset isn't red. It's gold and rust. And the water, child, look at it. It's almost rose in this light. Rose flecked with cobwebs. Of eggshell blue. Cynthia, darling, a sunset's never just one colour. Do try and remember that, would you? And then there was Mr. Pound from the city. I gathered that he was terribly rich and he wanted to marry Mother. But he certainly didn't understand little girls. Uh, uh, Cynthia, I'm going to give you half a crown for being a very good little girl. Now, uh, tell me, what will you do with it? I'll buy something for money. Oh, no, no, my dear. This is your own money. Uh, you put it in a savings account at the post office and it'll make more money for you. Always remember, my dear, take care of the pennies and the pounds will take care of themselves. Then there was the wonderful wise woman who knew all the things that aren't in books. Always remember, my bunny, that it's good luck to touch the hump of a hunchback. But the curse of Beelzebub himself will be upon ye if he look at a sliver of silver moon through the glass. And then the strangest and most wonderful of them all was the lean, middle-aged man with a sharp face and the bee-net, whom I met one day on the Downs. Good afternoon, young lady. Good afternoon. I'm Cynthia Browning. My name is Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Why are you carrying that net? You looking for butterflies? Oh, oh, oh no, Cynthia. I'm a bee farmer. Bee farmer? Mm. Oh, that sounds funny. How do you farm bees? Well, come over to my place one day and I'll show you. I say that's a beautiful doll you're carrying. is isn't a doll. It's my mascot was given to me by Frank King, the painter. He made it for me. He made it to look as much like me as possible. I call her me. It's a remarkable likeness. See the hair? That's clippings off my hair. And the nails? Those are clippings from my own nails. She's really me. And I love her. Your own nails and hair? And the doll is an exact replica of you? I don't like that, Cynthia. Um, remember, my dear, my name, uh, will you, uh, it's, uh... Sherlock Holmes, and I live at the bee farm, and if anything unusual happens, uh, come to me at once. Of course, Dr. Watson. I'll confess that that first meeting with Sherlock Holmes rather frightened me. You didn't understand why he was so worried about the doll, eh? No, but I remembered what he said about coming to him if anything unusual happened. And I'm sure that that unusual something did happen. Yes, Mr. Bartell, and within a very few days. But at this point, I think Dr. Watson should take over the story. It's where he and Mr. Holmes really entered into Oh, it. very well. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Bartell, I was staying with Holmes. Late in the afternoon, as I remember, that you ran over to the bee farm where I first met you, Cynthia. A few moments before you arrived, Holmes and I, each of us with a cup of tea in our hands, were seated on the veranda, gazing out across the downs, and discussing the mutability of human affairs. It is strange, Watson, that after a lifetime devoted to the more flamboyant aspects of everyday life, that now... In what is the fast-approaching twilight of my days, I find such peace and companionship in the exact and predictable behavior of bees. <laughs> I wonder what Moriarty would have thought. Oh, you talking as if you're an old daughter of 90. You say what you like, but I don't think that you'll ever really be happy in retirement. You miss the danger, the, the excitement of the chase, the... The public acclaim. What? what are you talking about? <laughs> My work was never for the public. <clears throat> what did the public, the great unobservant public, who could hardly tell a weaver by his tooth or a typesetter by his left thumb, care about the finer shades of analysis or deduction? In any case, Watson, I chose a happy time to sink into oblivion. In comparatively recent years, the criminal seems to have lost all his originality and enterprise. My own little practice when I gave it up he seemed to be in danger of developing into an agency for recovering lost lead pencils or giving advice to young ladies from boarding schools. Oh, talking of young ladies, who's this little girl running up your driveway? Hmm? Oh, great Scott, it's uh, little Cynthia, Cynthia Browning. Oh, and who's she? Oh, a charming young neighbor of mine. Hello, Cynthia. Hello, Mr. Holmes. You've come to see how I farm bees, haven't you? No, Mr. Holmes. You told me to come to you if something unusual happened. It has. Something that's frightened me. Well, now, sit down, my dear. This is my old friend, Dr. Watson. Oh, how do you do, Cynthia? How do you do? Ah, Cynthia, dear, what has frightened you? It's my mascot. My me. Look, somebody stabbed her through the heart. Great Scott, a doll that's an exact replica of her. With a penknife thrust into it. Good uh, gracious me. When did you find your... your mascot like this? Just after tea. Mummy had some gentlemen calling on her. And afterwards I went up to my room... And found poor me on the bed. 
I remembered what you told me about anything unusual. And so I came over here as fast as I could. Yes, I'm glad that you did, Cynthia. But did you tell your mother where you'd gone with her? No, I didn't. She was still talking to the gentleman. Well, she'll be... She'll worry about you when she discovers your disappearance. No, don't worry, Watson. I shall go over and talk to her at once. Now, Cynthia, my dear. Yes, Mr. Holmes? Uh, who were the gentlemen calling on your mother? Well, there was Mr. Tanner. Yes. He's the man who looks after the estate for Mummy. Mm-hmm. Mr. King, the painter. Mr. King is the man who made this doll, eh? Now, who else was there? Mr. Pound. He's a businessman from London that's staying with Mummy. Hmm. And they were all present in your house when you found the do- the uh, mascot lying on the bed. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Mm. What's no chap? Yes, sir? I'm going over to see Cynthia's mother at once. I want Cynthia to stay here with you. Guard her, old chap, as you would your life. Uh, Mrs. Browning, I know I'm a seen like an intrusive neighbor, but uh, possibly you've heard of me. My name is Holmes, Sherlock Holmes. Well, who hasn't heard of the famous Sherlock Holmes? Uh, please sit down, won't oh, you? thank you. Your guests have left? Yes. But how did you know I had guests? I know you're a great detective, uh, but... Your charming little daughter, Cynthia, came over to see me half an hour ago. She told me. So that's where she went. Uh, did she come back with uh, you? No, Mrs. Browning. I felt it safer that she remain at my place for a while. My friend, Dr. Watson, will look after her. I'm afraid uh, she may be in danger. In danger? Mr. Holmes, what makes you say that? You know your daughter's doll, the one fashioned in her own likeness and with her own hair and nails? Of course. Frank King made it for her. Uh, while you were at tea this afternoon, your daughter found the doll lying on her bed with a penknife stuck through its heart. That's very peculiar. But I don't see that she should be in any danger because of it, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Mrs. Browning, certain practitioners of magic believe that if a doll-like effigy is made of a human being and the effigy is then mutilated, that a similar fate will befall the living original. But, Mr. Holmes, that's black magic. You can't possibly believe in it. not in the results of stabbing a doll, Mrs. Browning, but I... Well, it's possible that someone is trying to kill your daughter. To kill Cynthia? Oh, no. It may be more than a possibility, I'm afraid. And when these magical means fail, they will turn to more direct methods. But who could possibly want her death? You, uh... You have not remarried, Mrs. Uh, Browning. No, I feel it my duty to devote my life to Arthur's child, Cynthia. Yes, then anyone wishing to marry you might feel that Cynthia stood in the way. But that's absurd. But logical, Mrs. Browning. Do you mind if I ask you a very personal question? With Cynthia's safety at stake, you may ask any question. Are any of the three men who were present at tea this afternoon desirous of marrying you? Well, I... Please be completely honest, Mrs. Browning. Uh, At different times, they've all asked me to marry them, yes. And you won't contemplate marriage because of your dead husband's child? hmm? Uh, Tell me, Mrs. Browning, have you seen this penknife before? It was the one found stuck through the doll's heart. I don't think I've ever seen it before. One final question. Would anyone among Cynthia's acquaintances have a knowledge of, uh, the practice of magic? Well, uh, the old woman that Cynthia calls the wise woman might. Oh, who might she be? A strange creature that lives in some hovel on the downs near here. Mm -hmm. She brews weird concoctions with herbs, love filters, and all that sort of thing. I'd be a suitable companion for your daughter, Mrs. Browning. I know it, Mr. Holmes. I've told Cynthia over and over again that she mustn't stray off and see the old woman. But you know how disobedient children are at her age. I'm sure she's been over there recently. Mm, I'd like to talk to this woman. Where does she live? I don't know exactly, but Frank can take you there. He used her as a model. Uh, Frank King, the the painter? Yes, he lives in the village. Mm. Then I shall call on him at once and persuade him to accompany me. We must find that wise woman and, I hope, save your child from magic. Magic and possible murder. Much further, Mr. King. Only a few more yards, Mr. Holmes. A little cottage is just behind the trees there. It's a pretty broken down place. Poor old girl has only a few pennies to her name, I imagine. Mrs. Browning was telling me that you used this old woman as a model. Yes, she was a fascinating subject. I painted her as she was mixing up some devil's concoction of herbs and spices. I had her standing over a smoking cauldron with the firelight playing on her. It was... It was quite effective. Yes, it must have been. The uh, subject of witchcraft appeals to Mr. King? Well, I don't know anything about it. It was just that she was such a wonderful subject for a painter. Mm. Here we are. I'll knock on the door. I think we'll take the liberty of going in, shall we? Hmm, I don't see why not. What is it? Listen. It came from that room. 
Someone is here. Come on. Look at her. Look at her head. Poor devil. Yes, she's still alive. She isn't long to this world. Can you hear me? Here, let me lift you up a little. Can you understand what I'm saying? Tell me, who was it that did this to you? She's too far gone to speak. Got a piece of paper and a pencil? Yes. Wait a minute. Here you are. Thanks. Now, can you write the name of the man who did this to you? She's pushing the pencil away. I don't suppose she knows how to write. She's trying to show you something, Mr. Holmes. She's trying to crawl over to the wall. Yes. Yeah, let me help you. It must be a hiding place of some kind. Look. She's taking a brick out of the wall. What is it? Quick, Scott. Money. A vegetable jackdaw's nest of pennies. And small silver. And at least a dozen golden sovereigns. That must be the money. Look. She's picking out one of the silver coins. She's trying to give it to you. A sixpence, but what? Oh, poor woman, she's dead. And just as she was trying to tell me something. I can't understand it. Golden sovereigns in this hovel, and she was she was showing you a silver sixpence as she died. Mr. Holmes, what are you going to do? First, check on the young girl's safety. Meanwhile, I should like you to go back to my mother's, assemble the other two men who were present at tea time this afternoon, and keep them there until I arrive. I shan't be long. But the police... I shall summon the Mr. King when I have the murderer to offer them, and I'm convinced that that will be before the sun sets tonight. <laughs> We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. Time enough for me to mention another wonderful Petri wine. Petri California Muscatel. If you like that subtle Muscat flavor, who doesn't, you really like Petri Muscatel. Petri Muscatel is a clear golden wine that is just as much a hit with the ladies as Petri Port is with the men. But I don't mean by that that only the ladies like Petri Muscatel. In fact, if you want to be sure to please everybody... Get both Petri Port and Petri Muscatel. In other words, don't buy one, buy two. But do be sure you always buy Petri. Now back to Dr. Watson and his guest tonight, Mrs. Campbell, who played a most important part in the story herself. Oh, not nearly as important a part as that played by Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Well, Dr. Watson, what happened when Sherlock Holmes rejoined you at the bee farm? Well, first of all, he made sure that the little girl was safe. Then he told me of finding the dead woman... And of his theories as to the killing, I can almost hear him now, Mr. Bartell. As he said... See how it was, Watson. <clears throat> someone wanted the little girl out of the way because they knew the mother would never marry while the child was alive. And that someone persuaded the old woman to do the job for him, I suppose. Undoubtedly. And she, believing in the powers of black magic, mutilated the doll, firmly convinced that in so doing she was destroying the young girl it was fashioned after. And then, I suppose, when the potential murderer discovered the woman was merely indulging in stupid folklore, he killed her, mm. realizing she was only a hindrance to him, and with her knowledge of the plan, a dangerous hindrance. Yes, exactly, my dear fellow. But um, how do you suppose we account for the hoard of money? Golden sovereigns, don't forget, that we found in the hovel. Well, no doubt it was a sum that she was already being paid for the murder that she was going to commit. Mm. As she died, she tried to give me the clue to her murderer by selecting certain, certain coin. Now, in her possession, she had gold, silver, and copper. She chose a silver coin. And yet I can't see its significance, I must confess. Well, at the moment, possibly not. And yet, before the evening's over, I bet you that... What did you say, Watson? I said before the evening's over, I, I bet you... Thank you, old fellow. That's the clue. You bet me. What on earth are you talking about, Holmes? I was just saying... You've just given me the answer to the whole problem, Watson. What? I'm much obliged to you. Stay here, will you, old chap? And look after Cynthia a little while longer. Within a very short time, I shall have her intended destroyer under lock and key. Mr. Holmes, I'm glad you've come. I've had the greatest difficulty in persuading these three gentlemen that their presence was necessary. Within a few minutes, Mrs. Browning, two of them will be entirely free to leave if they want to. Mr. Holmes, I think it'd be a good idea to tell everyone what happened. Yes, uh, well, uh, Mr. Pound, Mr. Holmes, I don't I think... I think it'd be a good idea to Indeed. tell everyone what happened. Yes, how do you do, Mr. Pound? Oh, oh how, how do you do, Mr. Holmes? Uh, look here, if there's some scandal down oh, here... Oh, there is, Mr. Pound. Uh, then I want my name kept out of it. You hear? I have a seat on the London Stock Exchange. Oh, very comfortable for you. Yes. 
And the other gentleman, by the process of elimination, must be Mr. Hugh Tanner, the manager of your estate, Mrs. Browning. Yes, I'm Hugh Tanner. And now, Mr. Holmes, supposing you tell us what this is all about. I'm a straightforward man, and all this mystery is rather aggravating. Something has happened. Something that concerns us all. What is it? Murder. Murder? <laughs> Murder? Good Lord, who's been murdered? An old woman who lived in the village. Your daughter, Mrs. Browning, referred to her as the wise woman. Mr. King and I found her tonight in a cottage on the downs, beaten to death. Murdered. Well, that's shocking, but uh, what's it got to do with us? I'll explain, Mr. Pound. Each one of you, I believe, would like to marry Mrs. Browning. Her daughter, Cynthia, is an obstacle to such a marriage. One of you decided to remove that obstacle and engage the wise woman to carry out the plan. Finding the woman clumsy and ineffective, you decided that she was a dangerous witness. And so, you murdered her. Fortunately, the poor woman, as she was dying, gave me the clue to her murderer. But how did she do that, Mr. Holmes? I thought you said that she died without speaking. Uh, she did, Mrs. Browning, but she gave me the clue nonetheless. Though I was shockingly slow in spotting it. Well, what was the clue? Uh, yes, let's, let's stop being mysterious and come out into the open. Uh, you were with me, Mr. King. As she died, I shall let you tell them. Well, she was dying, unable to speak when Mr. Holmes asked who had attacked her. She couldn't write, but she showed him a hoard of copper and silver coins and a dozen golden sovereigns. Sovereigns in a hovel like that? Oh, I, I, I see. She meant her murderer was the man who had paid her. And with all that ill-gotten wealth, she died clutching a silver sixpence. Well, and you I... still don't uh, see who the murderer is? <laughs> Come along, gentlemen. You should know it as well as you know your own names. Now, Mr. King mentioned that there were a dozen sovereigns. Whose name does a sovereign suggest? Sovereign? Sovereign? King! You, Frank King, were the murderer. Oh, that's ridiculous. The old woman wasn't exactly a mastermind. Why should she be so, so indirect? And how much is a sovereign worth? A pound. And your name, my friend, with a seat on the London Stock Exchange is pound. Oh, isn't it? this is absolutely absurd. I can prove that I've never even met the woman. Well, what is the answer, Mr. Holmes? I'm sure that you know it. The answer is obvious, Mrs. Browning, though I'm ashamed to say that a chance remark of Dr. Watson's gave me the clue. Oh, now look here. Stop beating about the bush, Holmes. What is the answer? A very simple one, Mr. Pound. With 12 golden sovereigns at hand, sovereigns that would suggest either the name of King or Pound, what coin did the dying woman select? A sixpence. Exactly. A humble silver sixpence. And what is the common slang word for a sixpence? A tanner. Precisely. Which tells us that you, Mr. Hugh Tanner, killed the wise lady. Try and prove it. That's all. Just try and prove it. Holmes, what happened? I found the murderer, old chap, thanks to you. What do you mean, thanks to me? Well, I was thinking of a sixpence, the coin the dead woman clutched in her hand, as a sixpence. When you said, I bet you, I thought of the much-used expression, bet your tanner. That gave me the clue to the whole business. The dying woman was obviously trying to indicate that Hugh Tanner was her murderer. He confessed, you say, before the police arrived. Yes, after Frank King, the artist, had started to give him something of the thrashing he deserved. Oh, I take no particular pride in the case, Watson. Without your chance remark, I might easily have overlooked this obvious clue that the dying woman gave me. As I've said before, old chap... I should not attempt to emerge from my retirement. Yes, 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 yes. It's obvious that my reflexes are shockingly slow. Rubbish. The police would never have solved it. Oh, my dear Watson, when you compare me with the police, I realize that my retirement should be permanent. Uh, by the way, uh, where is Cynthia? Well, I arranged with your housekeeper for her to have an early supper. Some kippers, a poached egg or two, a piece of that trickle oh, tart we had last it. night, and a pot of tea. Oh, for a 12-year-old girl, my dear Watson... This is an occasion when I might accuse you of being a potential murderer. Oh, come now, Holmes, you, you know perfectly well. Uh, Shh. Well, here she comes now. Hello, Cynthia. Did you enjoy your supper? It was lovely. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Is everything all right? Can I go home now? Yes, yeah, Cynthia. Everything's all right. Uh, tell me, my dear, did you ask Mr. King to make that mascot for you? Yes, Mr. Holmes. The wise woman told me it would bring me luck. Oh, yes, I thought so. Mr. Holmes, will everything be just like before? No, not quite, Cynthia. Uh, Mr. Tanner and the wise woman have gone away. You, uh, uh, you won't see them again. Oh, dear. But you have new friends here, haven't you? Yes, and nice ones. Remember that, Cynthia. We'll always be your friends. I will, Dr. Watson. I like you both so much. Ah, oh, I'm glad. <laughs> and tell me, Cynthia, uh, do you like Mr. King, the artist? Oh, yes. Almost as much as I used to like my daddy. 
Uh-huh. He's like my daddy a little. Oh, I'm glad to hear you say that, Cynthia. Uh, tell your mother the same thing, will you? I think it might change a peculiarly foolish notion of hers. <laughs> Well, Dr. Watson and Mrs. Campbell, that was a a really different kind of story. I'm sure glad you were here tonight, Mrs. Campbell. Tell me, um, has Dr. Watson changed much since you last saw him? Well, yes. I think he's grown handsomer. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. (laughs) And and, uh, what about Mrs. Campbell, Doctor? Has uh, she changed? Well, she is more grown up than the last time I saw her, but she hasn't changed much in one respect. Oh, what's that, Doctor? Your appetite, my dear. Oh. <laughs> I remember our Holmes was amazed at the amount you ate when you were a child, but you certainly had just as hearty a dinner this evening. Well, that was your fault, Doctor. Your dinner was too good. Uh, oh, Cynthia, don't, don't talk about the wine. Well, why shouldn't I talk about the wine? It was wonderful. Sure it was. It was Petri wine, that's why. You see? Now you got him started. And Mrs. Campbell... Petri wine is always good wine. That's because the Petri family has been making wine for generations. Ever since long ago when they started the Petri business, winemaking has been an art with the Petri family. It's a tradition, a heritage that they've handed on down from father to son, from father to son. Believe me, when it comes to turning luscious, sun-ripened California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine, well, you can bet your last dollar that the Petri family really knows how. No matter what type of wine you prefer, for any occasion, you just can't miss with a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Well, as next week, as St. Patrick's Day is only about six days away, Mr. Bartell, I, I thought next week that I'd tell you a rather unusual story that took place at Ireland at the turn of the century. It concerns the famous ceremony of kissing the Blarney Stone... St. Patrick's Night Revel, and an old Irish ballad that led directly to one of the most devilish murders that Sherlock Holmes and I ever encountered. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Copper Beaches. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. You can read about the stars of our broadcast in the April issue of Everybody's Digest. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California... Invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.